librarians, right? Have you ever had a question from a researcher about what to do with their data? Nobody ever came to you and said, you know, I, I've got a bunch of things, you know, that where should be, can you help me? Is there a place, something, you know, some questions? No, I think that the, the whole meaning of uh, data, librarianship, and uh, data But uh, um, researchers who will have uh, Horizon will come to you, you know that. So you will have increasingly questions about, about this. So it's good to start uh, preparing. And the first questions will evidently come from, uh, uh, yeah, from Horizon grantees. So, so the ones who are in Horizon, I mean, if you have lists of, of people, I mean, these are the ones you get the first questions from. Indeed, and actually, quite sure how to turn it on, can you hear me? That's exactly what happened at CERN. It didn't come from researchers, it actually came, uh, it didn't come from the organization themselves, you know, like thinking we just do open data. It's the researchers who came to the library and said, look, we need to submit this research data management plan. What, what do we do? Can you help us? So, you know, that's an, it's part of the Horizon 2020, part of Welcome Trials, part of uh, the UK National Research Council's policies, as Martin was talking yesterday. So it, it is already happening, and it's driving data curation and release. Uh, and it's, it's happening to a great extent, you know, much, much greater than what you would expect. I think we must prepare ourselves yeah. in our profession. Indeed, yeah. It's, it's very important. Uh, on what you said, I mean, because we worked quite a bit with uh, research data for the Recode project, and it's, I must say it's very clear that, that it, it's a sensitive issue, and researchers are generally not very willing to share their data, and nobody uh, thus far told them that they should do so. Um, it's also very clear that research data is very valuable, and that only about 20% of research carried out can be replicated because the data does not exist. So this is a problem. So I will disagree that the impetus, I mean, researchers need to be involved and, and of course the very uh, research intensive institutions and, and you know, the, the, front, the, the, the pioneers in research are involved. Uh, but overall, it, I mean, the impetus comes from the funders. We need to say this. I mean, UK researchers, it is not the researchers, it's the policy makers. So in this, I will so not sort of disagree with you, but I mean, what I've seen is everyone says, you know, yes, but the researchers, and then, well, let's see what our funder says. You know, whatever our funder says, blah, blah, blah. So, so it, it, as I've seen it, I mean, apart from areas where they routinely um, research is so data intensive that they routinely exchange data and they have a culture of sharing. Uh, other than that, for the rest of it, it, I mean, it's the policy makers who are forcing them to share their data. It's very, it's, it's really obvious it's to me. It's doing it and it has really, you know, acted, acted as a catalyst. But the issue is if you want to do it large scale and if you really committed to it, you need to have change within the organization, you know. Exactly, and, and uh, you know, external grants, research grants are an important fun part of funding of, of uh, research in Cyprus in particular. It's over 70%, you know. I'm very keen to do something with research data management in Cyprus, by the way, and you know, we've had a few conversations. We just cannot find a project. Um, I think it's important to prepare for this because if 70% of your funding comes from the EU, and uh, Horizon 2020 requires research data management plans. There's no way to go around that. But, you know, this is only one push. You need incentives for researchers internally to do it and become part of a routine practice. That's the way how we do science into the future. We're changing the ways of scientific communications and dissemination. You know, so what I tried to say there, the policies are really the game changer, but, you know, the real change needs to be embedded in organizations. It requires broader engagement, broader conversation, you know, broader policy framework for that. Uh, it, it's not just that when money comes, we request it, you know. It has to be for every project for a start, or it has to be on a trial basis, okay? We do it for Horizon 2020, and we experiment with project research from the Research uh, Foundation in Cyprus, you know. 
um, you, you can experiment and learn and share experiences because this is very complex and nobody really knows how to do it at this point. Everyone, this is trial and error, we're learning on the job. CERN are doing it on the job, NASA is doing it on the job, so why do we expect the University of Cyprus to know it, you know? And I think we need to be upfront about it and open. You know, there are no uh, preconceived answers, we just have to ask the right questions and work with it and do it. The Horizon 2020, I think, is the trick. If they, uh, I think, uh, at least this is what we're using. I mean, in, in Greece, when we, when we say open access, you know, research data management training, or you know, open access, uh, open access to your publications, they're not interested. When we say the Horizon 2020 requirements for open access and what to do. <laughs> Uh, grasps their attention. So what, I mean, this is, this is the catchy thing, but uh, yes, maybe gradually offering some, uh, especially with research data, some, some um, trainings or research data management, because I think what Vera said is, is very important, and I think it was also mentioned yesterday, um, and we, I think it should, some, a little something should be added to the policy. Research data management is the important thing to change the culture of researchers to address their data at the outset of the research process rather than at the end of it. And this makes it likelier that they, uh, you know, will um, you get into new good habits. Uh, but um, it's hard maybe talk to departments also. I think this is one good way, like you're talking to department chairs. But if you want to organize events, I think Horizon 2020 right now, and especially now because there's new calls. The, the new working programs are out. And I think next week is when they're being festival in Brussels, so they, they will be applying in March and like February onwards. So now this is the time that they've seen the calls and they're starting to prepare. So uh, putting Horizon up front, you know, to talk about open access and about research data management may be, may be um, a way to, to, to grab their attention for now. I have one question for, for Vera. It's about privacy, because you mentioned the issue once or twice, and I know that it's a very hot topic, because behind this data, uh, uh, there are people. They're not simple data that we can use and we, we can make money of it, or maybe we can uh, uh, progress the science for the science, but also behind little data or big data, and because also web mining has a lot of, uh, it's very problematic for uh, creating group profiles for specific categories of people, there is the hot question of privacy. Uh, we have the issue of the consent of uh, the data subject or the research subject. There is also the technique of making this data anonymous, but in your view, in order to promote this better, is there like uh, a good privacy policy? Uh, maybe not only from the beginning, but even afterwards, afterwards, because we have all this data that they are there. So I think this is another uh, hot topic, and I'm uh, mentioning it from a legal point of view, uh, because I think that uh, it shall also be settled. Yes, uh, look, privacy is only concern mostly for clinical trial data. It, it, it's the privacy of research subjects. So if you're testing new drugs or you're involved in a particular specific disease, which is very rare in the world, you know, there could be hundreds of people who have the disease and it's easily to identify that. The issues arise that, you know, with the new ways of linking data, uh, you know, interrogating data sets, bring many data sets together, you only need one link, you know, one common field. 
even if the data is uh, anonymized, you can actually use that common field to join one data set with another data set, which can be owned by another organization. And even though the names or you know, date of birth of, the, of the, the research subject in the database that you shared was deleted and not provided, but if you connect the data with another data set, which has one joint research field, which can be just the disease, all of a sudden you can, you can match the names. You know, you get them from another database. So in a network world, linking and privacy, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves whether privacy really exists in, in the network world. And look at the NSA spying. You know, we're not providing all the data, but you can have bits of, of data which can be connected with other databases uh, which actually enable, you know, uh, uh, can, can, can be a breach of privacy. But there are ways to de-anonymize data in, in more sophisticated ways, and there's lots of research conducted in this space by the National Institutes of Health in the United States. So there are methods, you know. The issue is to be always ahead of people who can potentially misuse data. But also we have to ask ourselves, you know, who's interested in misusing data of cancer patients? You know, is it really a big deal if someone works out that you participated in a clinical research trial? Uh, and, uh, you know, these are the questions we have to ask. And also, many people participating in these trials have no issue with the data being shared and consent. The issue is that we cannot share historical data but whether we could have an exemption that would override, you know, the need for uh, prior informed consent, that's one way. You know, in some countries the consent was collected anyway, but it was only for sharing with scientific collaborators. So now it's just extending that a bit further. So there's two issues. One is how you interpret the consent which was obtained at the time of collecting the data. Number two, if the consent was not received, uh, can you actually come up with an exemption or, the, or an institutional policy which will override the need for consent for data which was collected 10 years ago? And, and then, can we safeguard the privacy of research subjects? Look, the issue is whether we really need to share clinical trials data with everyone, but at the same time we need to share it more broadly. So maybe it's not something for public release, but for release for every researcher. You know, and that's the way it seems to go at the moment with the levels of control. So these are the issues we need to play with there. You know, uh, who has access when and, and to what data. And often, you know, pharmaceutical companies in particular, they won't give you the whole data set. They will only give you the extract of data you need for your research. And these claims are validated. You know, you've got the whole team of peer reviewers who look at your research proposal. They determine whether you actually can get access to the data. And only after that, they extract the portion of the data which you need to complete your research project. So. Um, to sum up, the claims that privacy is a huge issue, I think it's unfounded. The way it is managed right now, you know, it's, it's exacerbated. I'll told you clearly what the risk is, you know, that someone will uh, bring together data from different data sets and de-anonymize the data which was provided as anonymous. Uh, what's the risk and how can we manage the risk? And is it the real risk or is it an imagined risk? And I think we need to look at this from that perspective. And from what I can see, it's more imagined than real. Right, you're going against the, whatever the EU is saying. We'll have a problem here. You heard about the, you know, oh, I mean, yes. you cannot transfer EU mm -hmm. data to the United States and the whole Facebook problem with personal data, etc. Yes. Yeah. So, it's, uh, um, and also the notion of personal data. What is personal data? Is it your name? Is it your date of birth? Is it your residence? You know, like, can we kind of get a handle on what personal data is and what it is not? Because. Hmm. But with clinical trials, I think it's very particular. I mean, the pharmaceuticals and the clinical trials companies will never share their data. Actually, there is some people, there's some people in Brazil who would like to work with you. They have an entire database. They were telling me last year, their national clinical data is open, which is unheard of. I don't think anyone opens their clinical data, unless Australia does, and I don't know. But, yeah. but uh, anyway. Yep, so th there's lots of, uh, you know, well, again, like space for conversation there. Um, and, you know, it's also the issue, like John Willibanks from Biosage Network did lots of work on this space, and he came up uh, with a new concept of privacy that can be adopted in this. Uh, I'll maybe talk to you about that over the break.
Thank you. Thanks all of you for uh, participating to the first session of the day. Uh, let's have a 20 minutes break and be back at uh, uh, yes, 20 past uh, 11. Thank you.